All right, well, it looks like we're right at two o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, everyone, welcome to Cafe Conversations. We're excited to be here this afternoon. Um, we are, I'm Elizabeth Vaughn, Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy for the college. And we're excited, particularly this Derby week, to be joined by Dr. Cormac Bernock of Airdrie Stud. Um, he's going to talk to us about all things equine. And I will, a few housekeeping items before we jump in here. If you have questions, feel free to post those in the chat pod and we will do our best to get to all those um, at the end of the presentation. And I know a few of you submitted questions in advance, so we will hit on those as well. Um, and we do ask that everybody stays on mute just to kind of allow things uh, to flow a little bit better throughout the presentation. But again, if you have questions or need anything uh, or suggestions or whatever, just post those in the chat pod. So we will go ahead and get started here. And I guess, Cormac, we'll just dive right in. I mean, you grew up in Ireland. Tell us how you ended up in Kentucky. Why horses? Give us a little bit of your story. Well, thanks for having me on. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to speak to the group and Hello to everyone out there. Um, I was born in Galway on the west coast of Ireland. I was 1975. Seems like a long time, a long time ago now. Um, my father was very interested in horses. He was a school teacher. He and I went racing a lot. He got the four, me and my three siblings of us on horseback, taking lessons, doing some showing and things like that growing up. But I was the one who really, I think, took to the racing side. Um, I just had an immediate interest in it. My parents tell me that some of my first words were the race horses of the time that I was staring at pacemaker magazines when I was in the cot. And so it sort of just sort of started before it wasn't a conscious decision. It just seemed to be something that I was wired to, to want to do. So um, I went to school in, in Galway. I went to college and, and in my, I was always pretty much sure I was going to go to vet school. And instead, a couple of years prior to getting out of high school or secondary school in Ireland, I um, heard about a course in biotechnology that was new at the university in Galway, where I'm from. And sort of what clinched it for me to go into the biotechnology angle was that after your third year, after the junior year, the curriculum included placement in Kentucky. So I spent the summer of 1995 after my third year in college at Alltech in Nicholasville, did an internship there, did some research projects, was with several of my classmates, just had an absolute brilliant summer, loved Kentucky. It was a place I'd always wanted to come to, got to meet a lot of obviously Irish people that are, were already out here, got to work the September sale at Keeneland at the end of that year, and probably most importantly, realized there was such a thing as the Maxwell Gluck Equine Research Center. So knowing that I was going to go to graduate school, it sort of became a mission that I wanted to come back to go to graduate school at UK. Um, I got to meet Drs. Peter and John Timoney, uh, Dr. Tobin. So I really felt like there was a, you know, a camaraderie and sort of a welcoming option for me to, to, uh, to come there. So I started, I got accepted that spring and moved um, to Lexington in 96, the week before I turned 21. So that's how I ended up in Kentucky sort of per se. And, and really my motivation for coming over was it was kind of, I mean, academically, that's what I wanted to study, where I wanted to study, but because it was on horses, that's really what sealed it for me. So I was, um, you know, joined, the, joined the, uh, the department there and got to do four placements, uh, rotations in different labs, just to really find out where I wanted to land. And one of those rotations was with the late Dr. George Allen on equine herpes virus research. And I had independently a strong interest in immunology. And that was really where I thought I could fit my interests with an academic track. And so it was a real privilege to, uh, to study with Dr. Allen. I did my PhD with him. Um, we did a lot of research into vaccine development and understanding the immune response of horses to the virus, to the infection, and also to different vaccines that were out there on the market. And as many people may know, it's a very tricky infection, a complicated virus, very hard to vaccinate against. So still a lot of those puzzles, pieces of the puzzle need to be solved. But um, it was a huge education and an undertaking and, and an opportunity for me. So I went from there in 2001 to Wisconsin for two years to the vet school, did more vaccine development, uh, vaccine research on equine flu and equine herpes virus there with Dr. Lund, Paul Lund, 
and then came back to Dr. Harhoff's lab um, in 2003 and spent another three or so years, actually four years in Dr. Harhoff's lab back at UK, back at the Gluck Center. So um, somewhere in that time frame, there came, I had to take a leap of faith where I was going to transition out of academic life. I think for a long time, I was going to hopefully get a tenure track position and have a couple of mares on the side. But realistically, the more I did with horses, the more I wanted to be around them and more involved. So I had to take a big jump and uh, work for myself as, a, as an agent for a couple of years um, from probably 07 to 09 and then got hired at a big stud farm to uh, represent stallions at Adina Springs out in Paris. And I was there from 09 to 2017 and then transitioned here to Midway, Kentucky to Airdrie Stud. And I plan to be here a long time, hopefully, if they'll have me. Fantastic. So you've held, you know, several different roles, as you mentioned. Tell me about kind of how your education at UK in particular and your work at Gluck, you know, has really played into some of that work in the industry. It's, um, I think it's a real advantage. It's, it kind of depends, I think, on how you use it. I've tried to decide this for myself, like what, what do I use versus what, you know, doesn't transfer, but I think in the end, really doing a PhD and particularly at, at UK teaches critical thinking. And that is something that you carry with you no matter what you do the rest of your life. So in breeding race horses, as famously said by Anaga Khan a hundred years ago, breeding thoroughbreds is like a game of chess with mother nature. So, you know, there are so many moving parts. You've got an 11 plus month gestation. You've got one full premiere, assuming you're lucky. And it's really, it takes a long time for you to realize your goals and to test your, if you have hypotheses or the things you want to try to do or things you expect to happen, it takes a really long time to realize that and then to maybe tweak your process. So not to mention the investment, the financial investment in that. So there are a lot of tricks and tools that are out there, things like nicking and, and different theories that are in the thoroughbred industry and are getting a lot of tractions in some places about who to breed to whom and on what the success rate should be and, and giving it an A grade or a C grade or whatever. And I don't like to follow those for the reasons that I just don't think they hold much water. You know, I think you just really have to stick to go with your gut. It's not really an easy answer for people because they want to have something to cling to. They want to have a, a grade that makes them feel better, like they're on the right track. But ultimately, you have to just weigh in the more important variables about who your mayor is and who your stallion is, what your budget is and everything else. And we can, I know we'll talk about some of those things as we go on. So just trying to be objective and looking at things with a bit more of a biological, scientific approach, if you like, um, is something that I think weighs, weighs in my favor. But also, you know, that we have, you know, a tremendous population of thoroughbreds here in central Kentucky and a lot of veterinary and academic infrastructure. And so we have a lot of issues that pop up. You know, there was MRLS from the Eastern 10 Caterpillars and the abortion storm in 2001, 2002. Last year, there were a lot of problems with nocardioform placentitis, which is sort of an ill-defined classes of bacteria that cause the placentitis in mares and cause the, the foaling of sort of stunted, underdeveloped foals and underweight foals that don't thrive. Um, you know, this year, with, especially with the help of Dr. Lee and Dr. Adam, Dr. Harhoff and others at the Gluck Center, they've very quickly identified a novel rotavirus that's plagued a lot of farms in terms of the foaling outcomes early spring this year. So, you know, knowing people involved, and I'm very privileged to serve on the board at the Gluck Equine Research Foundation as well, that's something that I really enjoy because it sort of allows me to keep my hand in the, you know, the academic side a little bit but also to do what I love, which is more, more on the, on the, you know, out in the fields essentially. So, um, but you know, I think there are advantages, but nobody's ever going to be a real expert in this. You've got to, you know, you've got to stay humble. You've got to try to make a lot of decisions. Well, not assume, you know, too much and just let mother nature do what she's going to do and adjust accordingly. Yeah, it's, a lot of people have tried to conquer Mother Nature over the years, and I don't think anybody's <laughs> claimed success in that yet. So tell us a little bit about your role at Airdrie and kind of what that looks like, what you're responsible for. I, I kind of look at it as two primary roles that sort of fulfill two halves of the calendar. So 
my main role really is to promote and recruit mayors to our stallions. So at Airdrie Stud, it's a family owned operation founded and owned by uh, Brereton C. Jones, Governor Jones, who was governor of Kentucky in the early 90s. Um, and horse racing has always been his passion. His family, his son, Brett, now are, is really sort of driving the operation and, and Mr. Jones has sort of stepped aside somewhat. Um, but we have 170 mares-ish. We have 11 stallions that are commercial stallions that other breeders who, you know, will, will pay to use. We raise our own our own foals to yearlings. We sell them along the way at different stages, and we keep some to race. So we're sort of a an all encompassing, you know, family operation that makes the you know makes it all go around. Hopefully financially, in in a positive way. Um, so my sort of corner of it is essentially the stallion division. So we have with the eleven stallions, we have stallions at different stages of their careers, different levels of maybe popularity or success at different times and that they stand for different stud fees. So from as low as about $5,000 up to right now, up to uh, 17,500. And at times we've had stallions stand for more. So I'm kind of the liaison for breeders who are trying to make, you know, trying to be involved in the game and trying to make good decisions and, and breed horses either to win races or to sell, to stay in the game. Um, I offer mating advice based on what I think, you know, that maybe there will work best with their stallions, um, you know, and I help in sort of all aspects of, of that side of it. So that, that role is particularly busy from sort of the second half of October, especially November through to about now it begins to taper off when, you know, the breeding season is still going on full steam for another month or so, but most people have made their decisions. Their mares are booked and it's just a question of getting those mares bred and info. So that aspect of it begins to sort of taper down now. And then we hit the summer, which is a little quieter for me, but then the sales start. So we'll have yearlings to prep and to sell starting in July. And then the wind and, and mostly in September. So July sort of through September. And then we'll have the foals of this year that will be coming of age to sell as weanlings in November and January. So it, you know, one season rolls into the next, but the year kind of has two halves in, in that respect. So I'm, very involved in the sales side, you know, representing the farm at the sales at Keeneland or Fasig Tipton or elsewhere, where we show the horses to prospective buyers, answer any questions, have all the vet reports on hand and so forth. So that's basically the, the two main roles. So let's talk about the breeding side a little bit. What, you know, when you're considering mating two horses, I mean, what are factors that you look at? What are there, you know, is it just like you're fast and you're fast, so let's make a faster horse? Or I'm sure it's more complicated than that. It's as complicated as you want it to be, that's for sure. <laughs> but you know, the old adage of breed the best to the best is the best strategy is true in most respects. But the reality is, and this may be where some of my background comes into play, at least in my own mind, it makes me feel better. The reality is that the heritability of racing performance is only a about 35 percent so you know if you're in livestock and you're doing milk yields or back fat or bone density or some of the other livestock measures i mean you could have heritability coefficients of 0 0.9 90 percent you know reliability that you get better through the generations but racing ability we all know how many of these multi-million dollar yearlings and, and prospects have just not been very fast you know um so an awful lot of it is is the nurture the everything else that goes into it the how they're raised, how they develop, whether or not they have any physical issues and how they break from the gate when, when the race is on. So, um, so you really have to, you have to weigh a lot of aspects, I think, to try to, to, try to get to improve your luck. Um, one of the major factors in deciding who to breed a mare to is what, what your end goal is. So nowadays, most people are trying to breed to sell because breeding to race is, you know, it, it's just so expensive. It's so risky. It's not something that many people can afford. So, you know, that, unfortunately, that's kind of a dichotomy. It might be a bit counterintuitive, but if you're breeding to race, you can breed to whichever stallion you think gives your horse the best chance that you can afford. But if you're breeding to sell, you've got to breed to the prettiest stallion that's going to throw the prettiest foal that you can afford, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because 
racing is determined on will and intangibles like competitive spirit. And you know, you'll find horses of all shapes and sizes in the winner's circle after big races and they can have offset knees or they can be back at the knee or sickle hocked or anything else, but you can't sell those. You know, the, the market is too discerning. You are, it's, you know, it's really kind of imperative that you breed something that's got size, that's got, it's, that's attractive, basically has some sex appeal when hundreds of people at the sale are going to weigh your son of some stallion versus the other, maybe 50 or 75 others that are on offer. So you've got to stand out some way and you can't stand out showing your speed. All you're doing is walking up the back. So, you know, you've got to be, you've got to have size. You've got to have that sort of shape that people want. You've got to be correct in terms of angular limb deformities, straight to the ground, not offset or, or in at knees or, or so forth. Um, you've got a vet clean, which is a huge issue in terms of, you know, a hurdle that people have to pass in order to be profitable. So you're fishing in two different ponds a lot whether you're breeding to race or breeding to sell. So anyway, that's kind of a long-winded way, but it's, it's a huge factor in your decision. Um, another factor would be whether you're gonna to breed to a proven stallion or an unproven stallion. So a young stallion that just came off the track that might be really fashionable is what a lot of commercial breeders will try to gravitate to. But again, if you're breeding to race or if you've got a a very valuable mare and you can afford a high stud fee, you're better off going to a horse that'll get you runners. And yeah. a horse that's got that proven ability. So that's another another big part of it. And, and back in the day, people would breed young mares off the track to proven horses the first two, three, four years to give them a chance. Because then if the mare proved to be unsuccessful, you could kind of you know blame her essentially because you were breeding her to the right stallions, at least they're proven stallions. And that doesn't apply if you're breeding to, you know, the first year horse every year because they might not pan out either. So, but that doesn't really, you know, the commercial market has been driving that low risk, the risk averse breeder towards the, the first year stallion mm -hmm. pretty often. So, and then another maybe final aspect is if you're breeding, especially to sell, you have to sort of see around corners to where that stallion is going to be two and a half or three years down the road when you have a yearling to sell. So if you picture yourself with a mare in November and you're deciding who you're gonna breed her to the following spring, you might, if the stallion's popular, you might have to get under contract straight away in October or November to book your spot. It might be five or six months or three months, whatever, before you start breeding the mare. It's another almost year before she foals and it's another year and a half before you have a September yearling to sell. So you might feel really good about your choice of stallion in November of you know 2018, but you might not feel really good about your yearling and, and where that stallion's held in what regard he's held come September of 21. So that's you know, and that's something that it's very hard to get right. It's kind of like speculating on anything, you know, stock market or whatever. But it's generally there are ways you can you can at least try to predict who's hot. And sometimes it's often good to breed to a horse that's in a little bit of a lull, maybe a horse that hit a peak. And then got a couple of really strong books of mares, but hasn't had headline horses in those two years and breed to him in that third year. When he's a little lower, maybe the stud fees come back down. Maybe you're not breeding in such a large book of mares. Your mare, your mare might stand out some more. But by the time you have a yearling out of that mare, if you're lucky and you were right, the two and three year olds from those good books that preceded your mare's book might be out there making headlines. And that's when you can really, you can really hit a lick because you might breed to a horse for 10,000 that now stands for 30 or 40 and his yearlings might be averaging 200, you know, so it's, you know, again, one of the, you know, one of the many things people have to kind of juggle and it's, it can be frustrating and hard to hit the right mark. But uh, those are some of the, some of the factors. Um, and certainly phenotypic mating is maybe my number one. I didn't even mention it, but it's, you know, you're trying to breed the right, the right physical, trying to get away from any faults your mare might have and trying to accentuate any, any strengths. Yeah, absolutely. So in thinking about that, are there, do you turn down sessions when people approach you, you know, you guys have a, your stallions and are there reasons that you would say no to someone? There are. Um, and, you know, to be perfectly frank, it depends in large degree on the popularity of the stallion. You know, there are a lot of stallions that don't get full books and you're more on the recruitment end of things than, than turning ones away. Um, 
and it's a t- it's a tricky thing to do you know you don't want to you know tell somebody you don't want to basically insult somebody's mayor i mean it could you know but you've got to weigh several things you know a lot of our stallions a lot of stallions you know commercial stallions anywhere are syndicated so when a farm like Airdrie brings one in we often invite it depends on the deal sometimes they're a partnership with the original owner or maybe we own it 100 percent and retire ourselves but in many cases you invite breeders that you're partners with to buy in in our case a 40th share you know in a 40 share syndicate and they share the expenses but they also share the revenue and the upside if the horse succeeds and so i would have the responsibility to the shareholders to the syndicate as well as to the stallion to get the best mares available um, most of the mares that you would be forced to decline would be on the grounds of age or, or spotty reproductive history so you know number one is you got to be able to get them in foal to give to maximize the opportunity so mares you know even qualified mares that on um, pedigree are strong if they've only had one foal in the last four years and they're 18 years of age, you know, you really have to be judicious about those. Not to say you never take them, but it's very tricky. You've got to have a lot of good reasons. Um, other times, you know, people get can occasionally get excited about the mares they own and they want to overspend. And, you know, it's might sound a bit tongue in cheek, but it's as much for their benefit as your own that you don't charge this stud fee because whatever they get, it's going to catalog 110th of 110 you know, offspring and nobody wants to be in that position. So, and then simply, you know, at some point you get full, you know, we'll cap our stallions at about 150 mares, which is just something that we personally like to do at Airdrie. So to, you know, for several reasons, but, um, you know, when a horse is full, a horse is full. And so that's more often than not, than not the case. And, you know, usually when you have to turn a mare down, the breeder has another mare in mind or they might have a second option that you like better that fits better that makes more sense so you we don't turn away too many people that you know leave with their tail between their legs but at the same time it's it's a bit of a balancing act at times right so danielle just posted a great kind of follow-up question on this how do you get that information about the mares do you all have like a form do you just have a discussion as people approach you how, how does that work um there are actually pretty good resources from the Jockey Club primarily. Um, there's a, a software called Mare Produce Records. That's basically the starting point that I use. And you can plug in any mare's name. And if there are mare, you know, select the mare that you're, if there's multiples with the same name. And it'll just list basic information, who they were bred to, what years, whether there was a live foal, cold or filly, and whether they sold. So you can get a really quick snapshot of, of, what you're looking at and what somebody is submitting so you know age and that kind of three cross pedigree three generation pedigree and then if you want to look a little different deeper you look at you know the catalog pages or the actual catalog style pedigrees that show you who are the offspring of her first second third fourth times to really see and that's not you know again good horses can come from anywhere you know when we look back on some of the best horses that came out of the stallion barn by our stallions those mares weren't always the obvious ones that produce them you know we're not none of us are clairvoyants when it comes to knowing who's going to work or not so you you kind of keep your you keep yourself grounded but like i said you just you have to do the responsible thing and you can get some pretty good um you know pretty quick it would take me i can usually do it while i'm on the phone with somebody and get a pretty good handle on it but usually if there's a reason to pause and you know convene with the with the, the team here then we'll do that sure sure so you know when you guys are looking at you know when you're marketing your stallions it, how do you i guess i would assume if you've got a stallion that has won a derby or a preakness or you know any major race that's probably a little bit easier and you talked a little bit to the age of the stallion and kind of how that plays in how do you market just what is it maybe a good solid horse that you don't, it, you know, he's not known for being a major race winner, but you know, he is a good horse. How does that, what's your approach on those? I'd love to know what your ideas are because it's not, <laughs> <laughs> but it's honestly, it's kind of the crux of, of what we deal with sometimes. Um, I think when you're starting out, you know, horses have to have, they have to have a pretty high bar to, 
these sustainable Kentucky stallions. You know, it's a fairly small bullseye for what's, you know, for what's uh, acceptable. So they're all going to be known to one degree or another. If they're not known and you're trying to, and you're starting from there, you're really, you know, you're really just going to struggle. Um, so, you know, I think you have to do some just sort of basic advertising to connect the dots for people to just basic ads with the horse in his silks, winner of the grade one champagne or Stephen Foster or, you know, whatever the, the signature win was, something that might expand on his quality, like a speed figure or rating, you know, 120 buyer speed figure, that type of thing that resonates with the breeding community, like, oh, that horse was, I didn't know he was that fast, you know, and you're only going to get two seconds of any attention from anybody. But if you show the horse with his pedigree, his sire and dam, and maybe winning a big race at a recognized track, you know, with the twin spires in the background and the silks, then people begin to, they get reminded. Because oftentimes you'll talk to somebody and you'll say, oh yeah, that horse that, you know, won, won the grade one in New York last week, trained by Bill Mott, so-and-so bred him, sold him for 625,000. He's by Paul, well, what's his name? Well, I don't know. You know, so you've kind of got to, you've, you've got to just sort of make it easy for people to know who your horse is. But really, once you do that, biggest thing is to get them out to see the horses and anyone that is interested in in thoroughbreds or knowing more about them should take every opportunity to see them in person because there's no compensation there's no substitute for watching them in their own environment and seeing how they move and you know just kind of what they are like as horses that's kind of the most fascinating thing about the industry is how they're all individuals and they've all got things to like some more than others but they have so much presence it's kind of like being in the presence of you know pro athletes or something I mean they're just kind of different you know you can you know you know what they are before you're even told so um and that's really you know being here where Airdrie is situated just outside of Midway you know we're between surrounded by a lot of the other big farms whether it's Lane's End or or Coolmore or Windstar um places like that and we've you know we're on that route where, you know, people, we, we got a ton of traffic when we have a new horse or even if we don't, but kind of every November when people are making their decisions, we just get a lot of people coming by and that's what you need because they might think they remember what the horse looked like, or they might've had a preconceived notion, but when they see them, that's when, you know, you're more likely to find interest. <laughs> so Jane Talbert submitted a question here, kind of going back just a little bit asking if you could comment on artificial insemination as an option for a successful pregnancy. That's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> a good one though. And I'm not, I'm not afraid of it, but I'm just, it's, it is a hot topic and a political kind of issue. The reasons, and I, I would be against it in short. Um, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with the jockey club mayor on mayor cap you know, the cap on mare books where now some stallions breed over 250 mares in a Northern hemisphere season, which is just in incredible and does run the risk of saturating the market and shrinking the gene pool and other effects. And so the jockey club has now come up with a mandate that any full, any stallions that were born in 2000 or late 2020 or later can only breed 140 mares a year. And that's getting some pushback from some farms. It doesn't particularly affect us at Airdrie because that's kind of what we like to do anyway. But, you know, I can see how it would work some other operations. Um, there, you know, a couple of reasons I would be against AI. One is there are a lot of ancillary industries that depend on live cover, whether it's the vanning companies, you know, the, the, um, the uh, shed, stallion shed crews, you know, people like that. I mean, you know, boarding farms that get resident mares in, you know, seasonal mares in from out of state to be bred on live cover. There could, there would really be a lot of fallout if it went to AI. I would be terrified of the lack of regulation over, over how many mares, you know, if it's, if AI is allowed, then why not embryo transfer and surrogate dams and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it just kind of spirals from there. So I'd, I'd be a staunch, you know, opponent of, of it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a positive, but I know FedEx would make a lot of money shipping semen straws all around and vets would make a lot of money for AIing 
you know, mayors, but not many other people would. And I just don't think it's the right, you know, there's something to be said for mother nature and, you know, and maybe I'm a bit traditionalist that way, but having the live cover and occasionally you've got stallions that are subfertile or infertile and, you know, or stallions that get arthritic or have stifle issues and they just can't breed mares. And as frustrating and disappointing and financially, you know, damaging that, as that could be, that's nature. You know, we've all dealt with them and it hasn't stopped us. And I just don't think, you know, going to AI and jumping phantom mares and everything else is any kind of solution that I'd be a fan of. Right. So kind of shifting gears a little bit and thinking about kind of the racing side of things, you know, obviously pedigree is a huge factor, you know, as we're looking at the breeding side. If I'm out at Keeneland or Churchill or, you know, how do I factor that in as a fan when I'm looking at, you know, who I want to bet on? How do I can take pedigree into consideration or is that too much? Should we just pick a, my favorite number? Yeah. yeah, it's it's probably next level for, you know, at least somebody who's new to new to the racetrack to start looking at pedigrees. But there are all kinds of ways horses can win and lose. And sometimes beginner's luck is the best approach. So if you, you know, if you see a a two-year-old by American Pharaoh when you were a fan of American Pharaoh, I'm not going to stop you. Um, but I think if I'm handicapping, I would look at pedigree when a horse is doing something new for the first time. So um, particularly first-time starters, you know, the two-year-old baby races that they run at Keeneland in April. Um, you know, there was there were winners by all types of stallions, but, you know, it is now a uh, horse one, a colt one, couple of weeks ago and Tisna would not be the type of horse you would pick out as a sire of early spring two-year-olds but you know other stallions are much more you know speedy and and typically throw more precocity and so I do think pedigree is an angle you know back in the day successful appeal and some of these stallions were that was what they did you know they were fast themselves and they threw fast and cities it and, you know horses like that so you could that that's when I would look more at pedigree because there's no form to look at in those races anyway you're just looking at trainers, pedigree and work tabs. Um, but also if you're looking at older horses that have run before, but now all of a sudden say they're switching surfaces or they were running 10 times on grass, now they're going to the dirt or they're running one turn, you know, six, seven furlong races. Now all of a sudden they're going a mile and eight. Then you're looking at the pedigree to see if that's the aha moment. Like maybe this is what this horse was supposed to do all along. And so that's, I think where it comes into play, but again, I'm pretty horrible handicapper. So <laughs> no, no secret there. Yeah. So we had an audience submitted question in advance, kind of along those lines. What makes some horses good on turf, some good on dirt, some horses prefer the mud? Is it just, just you know, a luck thing? Is it is there any indicator that you could look at in advance to say this is the horse for a turf race? Is there you, I mean there are clues without maybe being being any firm answers. You know, it's a great question because, you know, sometimes I talk to people and they're like, oh, that horse looks all turf to me. And I'm kind of, okay, you know, I just, it, it's sort of in the eye of the beholder to some degree. And to be honest, the um, surface preference is fairly versatile most of the time. There are kind of exceptions that you notice. There's a stallion called Kitten's Joy that Ken Ramsey had and raced and stood for a long time. And now he's at Hillendale. And he's an excellent sire, but 99% of them are grass horses. Um, Sadler's Wells in Europe was the same way, and Sadler's Wells is Kitten's Joy's grandsire. So, I mean, you can find bloodlines that you're fairly confident, you know, if they're on the dirt, you, you know, you downgrade them. Um, and you'll be wrong sometimes, but I think you're, you know, you're stacking the odds in your favor. Similarly, I worked with Austin again at Adina Springs for a long time, and barring a couple of exceptions, they were all dirt horses. And so, that was, an ang that was a betting angle that was kind of fun sometimes was first time dirt for an awesome again. So um, physically, there are some differences um, between the horses. I mean, you will see turf horses that are small and slight. Like we say, you could slide them under a door. You know, some of the European imports, they look like they weigh eight, 900 pounds. They might be 15 hands and just narrow chested and little wisps of things. And they're some of the best turf fillies there are. You know, they wear a breast girth and the whole lot. I mean, but they're the turf. I think the biggest difference really is the turf racing is more of a 
kind of a contained tempo and a sprint finish. Dirt racing is break from the gate, go as fast as you can and last to the line, you know, just sort of duel everyone else into submission. So with that, the horses are built a little bit differently. If you look at the sort of the prototype, the turf horses can have a bit more of a hawk angle. They can have longer, softer, slacker pasterns. Um, they're built for efficiency and long action and sort of like long distance runners, right? They're, they're just kind of good air and just an efficient motion and keep going and then have a kick at the end. Whereas the dirt horses are a bit more of that, more bone, more substance, usually a straighter hind leg, tighter pasterns where they're not sinking at all. So when they break from the gate, they're like coiled springs. They can really go very fast and they'll go faster the first quarter of the mile than the last quarter in just about every race. But they're built for that. And then they often have just a lot of mass. It's that strength kind of, and I, maybe, I don't know if it sounds intuitive or not, but it's, that's often how they're built. So there's obviously some crossover where you get confused, but um, that would be a couple of the differences. So Dr. Horhoff submitted a good question for us here. Where do you see the greatest need or the biggest opportunity for the thoroughbred industry? <clears throat> um, so we, we just need to make it a better sport, which is very vague, but there are, there are several aspects to that. Um, it needs to be safer and tremendous meaningful steps are being made in that regard make no mistake i mean it's it's getting so much better at a very quick rate um we need you know i think testing has always been sort of a challenge but enforcement is where we can really make ground you know the enforce i've always felt this way that the, it's the, the penalties or the lack of penalties and the consistency or inconsistency between states and between you know people who infringe uh, on the rules that's, I think, something that we, most of us find unacceptable or at least deficient. Um, and then, you know, there's another side to the industry and that's the horse players, the gamblers. I mean, they are the funding source. You know, we need it. I mean, to me, the owners and the gamblers are sort of one and one A. And you can argue till the cows come home who's more important, but I don't, I don't care. I mean, they're both vital. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of money that gets wagered in racing. And I thought one of the most surprising kind of positive things that came out of COVID, at least in the horse racing industry was that betting handle almost didn't drop off at all. The number of races run sort of in April, and May last year dropped, I forget, but let's say 60%, 70%, but the amount of money wagered only dropped 10 or 15% ish. And it just showed that people love it. And it's, it's a puzzle like no other. I mean, you can bet, you know, cards and, different casino games, but the, the menu of options available, whether you're betting Superfectas or, you know, all these different options that you can bet in, in horse racing and the possible payoffs are pretty exciting to a lot of people. And so I thought that was really heartening that the industry has this, seemingly has this base. So now we need to grow that. And so again, positive things are happening. Fox News or Fox Sports um, are, uh, collaborating with Naira, the New York Racing Association. They've got really good TV programming. They're going to do, I think it's like 700 hours of coverage for the next, each year, for the next 10 years. I mean, it's pretty immense. It's on YouTube. You can watch it without a cable subscription, you know, and it's very high quality programming. And so that's growing a new generation of betters. I think we saw that maybe carrying over from last year. Um, so that's an, an aspect as well. So I think safety and integrity really have to be number one because the public perception is still pretty low in a lot of cases, um, unfairly so, but again, you can argue that till, you know, till the end of day, but um, those are things, I'm comfortable that a lot of really big things are happening and things are all trending the right way, but we've got to keep our foot on the gas. You know, they still haven't finished the FBI investigations, the indictments of the trainers and the other co-conspirators. There was a third guilty plea this week, but you know, the sooner these things really kind of get wrapped up and people just get punished to their proper extent, then I think people can really realize that racing is doing the right thing. So, you know, the highs of legislation is obviously coming under some fire from different states as well. Um, it's something that I think is sorely overdue, but not a simple fix either. I mean, it's going to have some, some pitfalls or some, you know, some hurdles along the way, but we just don't want the 
what do they say the perfect to be the enemy of the good and just you know get it moving and adjust you know we can always evolve but trying to go with the status quo and expect it to change itself is as long as i've been in the game it hasn't happened yeah absolutely so kind of along similar i guess maybe to that question the equine science major you know at uk has been wildly growing over the last several years it may be if it's not our largest major in the college, I think it's pretty close. So what would you say to all those students, you know, that are thinking about, hey, I want to get into the horse industry somehow, some way, what advice would you give them? Um, I, I think that they would be pleasantly surprised by the amount of opportunity that's out here. Um, you know, and obviously there's a, a big demand for service industry work all over and for I guess at the start, lower level jobs in the horse industry too. I mean, there's a shortage of people that really want to do the outdoor hands-on labor, but, you know, I can speak firsthand experience. If it's what you want to do, it's what you want to do. And the people that have any interest in trying it out or doing summer work or doing anything like that, they'll find jobs, I would think, in no time. Um, and jobs that, you know, those are the jobs you can advance from. There wouldn't be career positions, you know, but it's a great way to get started and then work the sales, meet people. You know, the one thing, you know, one of the best things about the horse industry is if you go to Keeneland for the races or for training hours in the morning or for the sales, I mean, you're surrounded by the Hall of Famers in the sport. You know, you don't, you don't run into Bill Belichick or, you know, Oscar De La Hoya, you know, at Kroger. But, you know, it's, it's very easy to make contacts and, you know, not just rub shoulders with, but, you know, have share common interests with people that, um, you know, that are from all walks of life, including hedge fund billionaires and everything else. So, you know, it's, I feel like it's, um, it's, it's an opportunity, but maybe, you know, good to start and give it three or six months at a level and go from there, you know, but not, you know, management jobs are the type that people don't leave, you know, so there just isn't that much turnover, but you can get into one from a rung or two below I think, you know, if you have the desire to do it, it's, there's, there's a big need. Yeah, absolutely. So we had one more question submitted here. Stephanie has asked, in the beef and dairy industry, genomic testing is used for herd selection. What role, if any, do you see genomic testing playing in the thoroughbred industry, particularly as a predictor for breeding success and performance selection? Yeah, great question. Um, there are... I don't know how many, but let's say four to six groups that have approached this from several aspects, you know, whether it's SNP detection or, you know, or targeting certain genes. Um, Emmeline Hill in Ireland discovered, quote unquote, the speed gene about 10 years ago, maybe more. Um, and it's a gene that's associated with, it's a, I think it's a single point mutation but the CC mutant is speed, you know, the CT, the heterozygous is sort of the middle distance horse with a little later development. And the TTs are longer distance horses that go a little, you know, start maybe four and up distance horses. Um, so, you know, maybe in the last 15 years, it's just begun to be kind of this growth industry. Um, Matthew Bins, Dr. Bins is a pretty esteemed equine geneticist and he's been working on a system as well and I probably won't remember very well what it is, but it's several hundred um, loci just scattered through the entire genome and trying to associate, you know, the sort of repertoire of loci with A, B, C, or D performance classes. Um, and I'm a, I was intrigued by that when I heard about it, I don't know, it was six or eight years ago. There haven't been outwardly any huge breakthroughs yet that I've heard, maybe they're keeping it under wraps and just buying all the right horses. But realistically, it, it doesn't seem, at least where I'm standing, that it's yielded the sort of aha, eureka moment yet. Um, in a way, it better not because, you know, you really run the risk of, if, if you find the solution, then, you know, this is an, an industry where anyone can have the biggest success. And so, you know, there's a danger to being too accurate. But I think it has some merit. I just, I would have maybe thought there might be a, you know, a product on the market now or something else that might be a little more fine-tuned than it appears to be, but maybe I just haven't heard about it yet. 
and it is Derby week. So our final question for you, who are you picking for the Derby? It's going to be a boring pick now because he's two to one favorite in the morning line, but um, it's, it's an interesting race. Um, the horse essential quality is a homebred for Godolphin for Sheikh Mohammed, who's put more money into this industry and tried to win the Derby harder than anybody in, in living memory, I would say. And he has a homebred who should be good enough to do it Saturday. Um, he won the Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland in October last year, or in, sorry, whenever that meeting was now with COVID, I forget, but um, yeah, it was in October on its normal schedule. Um, and I really respected him for that win. He came back and he won the Breeders' Cup. And since then, I've just thought he's the one they all have to beat. I mean, there have been horses that have won races, including a horse called Life is Good, who got hurt and won't make the, won't make the Derby. But there have been several horses that have been sort of touted as contenders to maybe knock off essential quality but all along essential quality has just kept winning he's five for five he's the one they all have to beat but behind him there are probably six or seven horses that are very kind of equally matched and you know I think there's one but there's like there's about five or six one a's that you know any of them could obviously pop up but since the Churchill brought in a point system six or seven years ago where horses qualify for the Derby based on earning points in prep races. It used to be where they qualified based on earnings in any graded stakes races, whether they were sprints as two-year-olds or turf races or whatever. So now the race has kind of changed and it's become more formful. It's become a bit more, not maybe predictable, but certainly more favorites are winning because some of the sprinters that are trying to stretch out and creating a frenetic pace and then fading to the back and allowing long shot closers to to get up late, that doesn't happen anymore or hasn't happened at least since the point system. So I think you can kind of take the form more at its face value. And uh, I like him and, you know, but won't be shocked if he doesn't win, but I'm, I kind of think he will. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we appreciate your time and you joining us today. I know I learned a lot. I probably should have said at the beginning of this, I'm like, Danielle is our equine philanthropy person and I'm, I, enjoy Keeneland and Churchill, but don't certainly know anything about the science side, uh, or at least not as much in depth as a I think a lot of people probably on this call. So I appreciate this today. This is very informative for everybody on the call. If you are interested, we have recorded this session. We will post it on our website and we'll send it out. So if you want to share with anybody else, we welcome you to do that. And I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of the week and Happy Derby. Thanks, Cormac. We Thank you. It. Thank you all.